Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Baptist Church. It's great to see all of you here. Let us stand together and sing. God's Word this morning. So let's just remember that God's Word is alive and it's a message for each one of us this morning. Let's hear what he has to say out of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Everybody. It's good to see you all. I'm so glad to be back. I missed you. I, I miss not being with my church family when I'm not here, but it was a blessing to get to worship last week uh, with some of our brothers and sisters in Christ at Blueprint Church in Atlanta within our own denomination. That was a great experience and uh, got some wonderful training uh, from our national replant organization and even got to spend a few days with our uh, beloved friend, Pastor Varnum. So I uh, got to do a lot while I was gone. So uh, it's good to be back with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're hoping we're going to maybe get him out here this summer sometime or something, okay? So that would be really good. Well, we're glad that all of you are here with us here at RBC. We are passionate about being a gospel-centered community, reaching out to the world, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, stewarding all that God has given us for his glory and by his grace, we want to worship him in all of our lives. We want to serve one another in the world, the lost and the hurting, right? And we do all of that as disciples of Jesus, discipling one another in love. And so we are glad that we get to do this work of God's grace together. So I'm glad all of you are here with us for worship. We have some announcements tonight. No small groups uh, for us tonight. 
Uh, it's one of our scheduled times off, and we're spending that time focusing on uh, working with some of our leaders, and we do that and gives you guys a break to spend time in fellowship together. So I hope you guys will make your own fellowship plans or do some outreach. Go find some folks that don't know about Jesus and go spend time with them. Don't just stay at home and just sort of like do your own thing. That's not what this is for. This is for you to reach out to other people and fellowship with other people, uh, either within the church or reaching out. So we want to encourage you guys to do that. If you didn't know that, we'll go ahead and make some plans for tonight and then make plans for the next time that we're off together, okay? So we want to encourage you to do that. Um, Next week, you'll be back with your small groups. Uh, So that's just a reminder of that. We are hopeful that we are going to have an Easter outreach the Saturday before Easter, an Easter egg hunt, still working on location and on some of those pieces. So you guys can be in prayer that God gives us some opportunities to encourage and invite and draw people in as we build towards Easter Sunday. Now that the COVID regulations are kind of dialed back a little bit, uh, we're hopeful we'll be able to engage our community a little more uh, in, in present ways. We're glad that all of you that are attending on Facebook or YouTube are watching, so we're glad that you're part of this too, and we want to welcome you to our worship. I think I got all the announcements. Did I get all the announcements? Somebody back here. Oh, Tech Sabbath. When is that? April 3rd. So there you go. So that's two Sundays from now. Tech Sabbath, April 3rd. Uh, we won't have uh, all of this equipment, but uh, so we'll show up a little bit later at 930 Uh, and then do our prayer and and set everything up then. But yeah, those are all the awesome things we get to share together. And do we have a reading? Maggie's going to do a reading. There you go. Every month here at Redeemer, we have the opportunity to corporately profess our faith. Today we have the privilege of using the Lord's Prayer based on Matthew 6. I will read the part that says leader and we will read the part that says congregation and you can follow along using the screen oh God through Jesus' sacrifice you have restored us as your forgiven children in his name we pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name help us to know you through your inspired word and to live by it as children in your family Give us your Holy Spirit to rule in our hearts and use us to extend your kingdom of grace to others. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make us zealous to carry out your will as gladly as the angels do and to conform our will to yours. Merciful Lord, since you are the provider of all things necessary for our bodies, Fill us with trust. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Continue to erase our sins and help us gladly to forgive and to do good to those who wronged us. We know the devil seeks to destroy our souls and the world world lures us to ruin by appealing to the desires of our flesh. Guard us from the poison of misbelief and the trap of unrepented sin. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep safe our bodies and souls, our property and honor, and above all, send the Holy Spirit to preserve our faith in Christ, which leads to everlasting life. For all these petitions, we look to you as King of kings and Lord of your church. For thine is the kingdom and the power (coughs) and the glory forever and ever. You alone hold the power to grant our requests. We worship you from whom all blessings flow, relying on Jesus who canceled our sins and made us acceptable in your sight. We pray with confidence. Let's stand together and sing. i 
morning. All right, before we begin praying, I want to remind us of why we pray this prayer. The purpose of this time of prayer is to confess our sins to God and admit that we need God's grace. We must be humble and ask our Father to convict, forgive, and cleanse us of our sins. And we need to ask God, the Holy Spirit, to illuminate our hearts and minds as we hear his word proclaimed today through the message. I invite you all to bow your heads with me in this time of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning as a people who are repeat sinners and have all fallen short of your glory. We have sinned against others and have also sinned against you. We are immoral people, liars, thieves, adulterers, idolaters, greedy people. We want what is not ours, covet what our neighbors have been given, and are impatiently waiting for your provision. Lord, we acknowledge our wickedness as we have indeed sinned against you. We are also guilty of unbelief, bad attitudes, inaction, gossip, laziness, apathy, and the sins that we commit as a church. Father, we need your grace. We are completely incapable of fixing our sinful nature. We cannot atone for our sins or be truly changed without your gracious intervention. Thank you, God, for your sufficient grace. Lord Jesus, for your sufficient work in the indwelling and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit to truly make us holy. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our thoughts, and see if there is any grievous way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. Thank you that you are absolute and that we can rest assured in freedom from the law of sin and death because of the death and resurrection of Christ. You are a merciful God. Father God, we ask you today, for conviction and conviction of sin in each of our hearts sanctify us in the truth which is your word holy spirit illuminate our hearts and minds reveal to us our sins and the idols we hold in our hearts father use your word which is living and active like a fire to burn our hearts idols teach rebuke and train us in your righteousness holy spirit come alive in us and move upon your people to guide comfort challenge and call us be at work in our hearts and minds throughout the message today and after when we leave this service. We ask that you would use Pastor Chris to speak boldly, clearly, and effectively today, that he would lead us closer to you in love and truth through his sermon today. And lastly, Father, we ask that you would cause our hearts and minds to be open to you today, that we would honestly repent of our sins, be genuinely changed by your good grace, Protect us from the schemes of Satan and temptations of this broken world. 
Help us to be imitators of God and live a life of love just as Christ loves us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to you, God. We ask and pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'd like to invite up our children's gospel team this morning. Welcome, welcome, kids. If you're joining us online, now it's time to gather your kids. So pause it for a minute and go get them. All right. How are we this morning? Good, good. All right. So every time we come to church, what are we going to do? We are going to ask, not only us, but everyone here, while you're listening to the sermon today, you're going to ask... Three questions. First question, what do we learn about God? Second question, what do we learn about Jesus? That's right. And then third question, what am I learning about me? Okay, so these are the same questions we want to listen for every single time because God wants us to answer them. So about God, he made the world okay and in that book called the bible very good he tells us lots of things lots and lots of things he tells us that he has a plan for us right so look at the up over here come we've been talking about the fact that god wants us to come to him every week for a few weeks now today come with what you have what does that mean come with what you have do we all have things? Not all people have all the same things, do they? We have different things. But God wants us to come to him with what we have. That's what we're going to learn about God today. Next one, Jesus. So this is a little different. He's not in the desert today. He is in a place with some of his disciples, and they're going to eat a dinner, okay? So they're all gathered around, but see this lady over here on the side right by Jesus? Yeah, she's down by his feet, and she has a little bottle of something. What does that look like? A potion? Okay. A perfume, maybe? We're going to read the story in our class today. She brought some perfume to the dinner. Well, that's not a normal thing that you bring, is it, to a dinner? But she did. I wonder why. We're going to learn today what she was doing. But that is something she had, and she brought it when she went to see Jesus. Um, but the disciples were very angry. They were not happy at all. They weren't thinking, oh, what do I have? I need to bring Jesus something too. Nope. They were thinking, she shouldn't do that. That's expensive. We should save that for something better. Mm -mm. Jesus said, no, she's right. She should bring me what she has. That's what we're learning about Jesus today. That's what he wants. Now, look at all of them. Now, in the slide, I didn't put what they have. They're all different. They're going to have different things. That's what we're going to talk about today. What do you have? Because every single one of those people up there have something. And see the question we're all asking? What do I have? That's what we're learning about ourselves this morning. We need to ask that question. What do I have? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning in our class, and that's what you guys are going to talk about in the sermon today. All right, thank you guys. Well, good morning once again, everybody. I am so glad that I get to open God's Word with you, and I want to invite you to open up your Bible, your copy of God's Word, to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we're going to be looking particularly today at verses 3 through 9 from Mark chapter 14, but to give us some context as we reflect on the invitations that God gives us to come to Him, I want us to begin in verse 1 
and we'll read through verse 9 as we reflect on the idea of what it means to come to Jesus with what we have. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand, for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. This is God's holy, inerrant, and eternal word. May he add his blessing to its reading and to its proclamation. We are beginning to wrap up this series that we have entitled Living in the Light of God's Invitations. Our lives are constantly being invited to engage in something. The news people are inviting us to watch the news, right? The marketers are inviting us to buy things. We are being invited to uh, work harder by our employers, right? Uh, We are constantly being invited by entertainment to amuse ourselves of all different kinds. The internet is full of invitations, some of them uh, invitations to places that maybe we shouldn't go at all, right? There are invitations around us. So what does it mean for us to live our lives in light of the reality that God is inviting us to come to Him? And today, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to come to Him with what we have. But throughout this series of messages, you've seen this kind of constant theme that Jesus is asking us to come as we very much are. He wants us to come to Him broken. He wants us to come to Him authentically. He wants us to come to Him thirsty for the only source of satisfaction that we can really find in life. That's Him. He wants us to come hungry and feasting on Him for life. He wants us to come to Him in our weakness and in our failures. He wants us to come to Him humble. And those should shock us because the world wants us to come, but they always want us to come in a transactional way. They want us to come in a way that, that is about giving them something or meeting some of their needs. They promise us something, and then they say, now you come to my reality, my place, my invitation for you, and, and you give me your life, your energy, your focus. And Jesus is saying, you come to me just as you are. And watch as I fill you up and satisfy you, right? Okay, we also seen that Jesus wants us to come to him often and in faith. He wants us to come like children, right? Believing and trusting in him. He wants us to come to him often like children coming to their father. So today, we're going to see how in the passage that we just read, this account of how a woman broke a bottle of perfume in the presence of Jesus' disciples in the last few days of his life, we're going to see how Jesus teaches us to come with what we have, to come open-handed with what we have, to come worshipful with what we have, and to come ready to tell the world a story. We do that through what we have, all right? So let's see how those break down. Let's talk about what it means to come to Jesus with what we have. The woman in the story is Mary. She is the sister of Lazarus and Martha. You might know them from some other accounts within the Gospels. 
in the last week of Jesus' life, Mary comes and she breaks a jar of perfume. And according to John, she, she pours the perfume over Jesus' head. Mark points out that she poured it over his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So she does this very strange thing. By the way, I know in the really cool kids' message, Jesus is sitting there in a nice chair and there's Jedi Mary floating up and down at his feet, you know. Um, but, but in reality, Jesus would have been reclining at table In fact, the text specifies that in the Gospels. He was reclining at table, and Mary just takes this this valuable perfume, this ointment, and pours it from his head to his feet, and kneeling at his feet, she wipes his feet with her hair. Does that shock you? It's awkward. It's weird. People don't do this. When was the last time you had a a big party, a feast, and one of your guests just came in, broke a bottle of perfume over your head, and then poured it all over your, you you know, your body and everything, and then began to rub your feet with their hair? This is strange. And Jesus says, she did what she could. She did what she could. I wonder if that could be said of a lot of us. For us to understand Jesus' statement, we need to remember this, that everyone who is seeking to follow Jesus, we have all been entrusted with kingdom resources and a kingdom mission. We're familiar with this parable, many of us, from Matthew 25, where Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a man who goes on a journey. He calls to himself his servants, and he entrusts to them his property, right? He gives away his property to them, and and he gives it in different measures. Some persons get five talents. A talent was a measure of money, and then to another person he gave two, and then to another one he gave one. What we need to take away from that reality is that all of us, like Mary, have been given something. We have been given some measure of talent and time and treasure, and we've been given that by our God who has entrusted these things to us. Now, if we steward or when we steward those kingdom gifts in a way that is responsible and fruitful, God will see to it that our lives bear fruit, that we have a measure of outcome that looks like something that is pleasing to God. It advances his kingdom. We'll receive God's praise. We'll we'll, uh, encounter that God wants to give us even greater responsibility, and we get to participate in the joy that God has for us. So if you keep reading in Matthew 25, you'll see that the men that were entrusted with some of their master's property, well, the guy who had five talents, he went and invested and traded with those five talents, and he made five talents more. The guy that had two went and did the same, right? The outcome of their lives was not just that they were successful in business with what the master had given to them, but they receive their master's praise. He says to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, wouldn't you like to hear God say that about your life? You come to the end of your life and God says, yes, I think what you did with your life, with your time, with your energy, with your financial resources, with all that I've given you, you have done well with it. You've been faithful over a little. Therefore, I'm going to give you more. I will set you over much. I'm going to give you greater responsibility. And we know in at least one of the versions of this parable that Jesus said, you were faithful with a talent, just a small measure. I'm going to give you a city for every talent that you used well. So you were faithful with five. I'm going to give you five cities. So God's going to magnify your responsibility and do that. But most importantly, you hear this invitation to enter into the joy of your master, right? So can I just pause us here and just ask you, is it possible that the lack of joy in your daily life comes from a failure to use that day's treasure, that day's time, that day's relational opportunities, 
in such a way that the master is happy. See, when we steward all that God has given us in a way that is pleasing to him, these are the outcomes. Now, what happens if we don't steward things well? Well, when we sinfully reject God-given gifts and opportunities for ministry, Scripture is also clear that certain things will happen. We will lose those gifts. God is not in the business of investing poorly. He will, in fact, take them away from us. We will receive God's just rebuke, and there is the very real potential that we will suffer eternal consequences. That does not sound good. But go through the rest of that story in Matthew 25, and that's exactly what you have. See, one guy was given five, one guy was given two. They went and invested those talents. One guy was given one. This is what he did. His master comes back and he says, Master, I knew you were a hard man. You expected me to actually do something and achieve something with this. And, and, and so I was afraid. I was afraid. So what did I do? I went and hid your talent. Uh, I buried it in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Now, what's the response of the master? Is he say, oh, you were afraid. I'm, I'm so sorry for you. You were afraid to risk my property? No. He says, you're a wicked and lazy servant. You're evil and you're lazy. See, the risk wasn't his to choose to not take. The master goes on to say, if you knew that I'm the hard man, then you ought to have invested my money. That was the reason I gave it to you. And then when I came back, I would get all that I had due me and I would get some back with interest, right? So the master's not happy. Here's what happens to the guy. He orders his servants to take the one talent away, give it to the guy who had five, because he did well with it, right? And then he says, cast the servant out into utter darkness. Now, whenever Jesus uses the phrase utter darkness, he's talking about a place of eternal separation from God. How seriously does Jesus take the idea that when he created us in his image and for his glory, and when he gives us daily breath and hour upon hour of time and resources in our bank accounts and physical strength and energy and dreams and desires and skills, what do you think he thinks of people who say, I will invest it only for myself or cower in fear? Friends, none of us wants to suffer the consequences that come from a, to a person who repeatedly refuses to give their life back to the living God. So, all of that should bring us to this place. What's in your hand, your life, that God wants to use? What is it that's in your life uniquely? Each of us uniquely created forth to image God. Each of us with varying amounts of resources in our lives. Homes or bank accounts or time or energy. All of us with different skills and talents that God wants to use for the sake of his kingdom. What is in your hand that God wants to use? Mary had a jar of perfume. In all likelihood, it was her dowry. It's what her family had set aside as a savings account to give in the most important transaction of a Jewish woman's life, which was to give this to her husband. It's what she has, and she takes it and pours it out over Jesus. So what's in your hand? What's in your life that God wants you to use? 
Now, there's an Old Testament parallel to this that's a wonderful story that you may not be as familiar with. You might remember that Moses met the living God in the burning bush in the middle of the desert after 40 years of paying a, a time of growth and having to learn and change and become somebody different after he tried to free God's people through murder and violent insurrection. God says, now you're ready, time to go back and free my people. Moses, at this point, doesn't want to have anything to do with it, right? So he keeps coming up with excuses. And one of his excuses is found here in Exodus uh, chapter 4, where he says, But behold, they, the children of Israel, will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Nobody's going to believe me when I tell them a bush caught on fire but didn't get consumed. I walked up and the living God said, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. Nobody's going to believe that. And then when, when, when I say to them, and he's appointed me to come and deliver you, they are really not going to believe this. The most powerful man in the earth lives just a few blocks down the street, and you are not him. So God says to Moses, what's in your hand? You guys ever caught that before? Well, what is in the hand of an ordinary shepherd? A staff, right? A staff. And, and, and so what does God do? He says, throw it on the ground. Now, now, really, what he's saying is cast it down. Release your staff. And there's a symbolism here of this moment. Moses, I want you to set aside your former identity, who you were as a shepherd. I want you to throw this down. So Moses does, and it becomes a serpent. And Moses wisely ran away from it, right? Have you ever given something to God and... It turned into something unexpected and scary, and you ran away from it? Maybe you said, God, here's my life. And God began to do things you didn't understand in your life, and it turned into something scary, and so you ran away from it? Well, Moses experienced that right there in a matter of moments, right? So the Lord says, hey, Moses, go catch the snake. Now, I hate snakes. So if God told me, go catch up that snake by its tail, I'd be like, oh, this is not good, right? But I want you to catch the symbolism here is God saying, I want you to take up that thing which was your livelihood again, but I'm going to change it. Moses was no longer going to shepherd sheep. He was going to shepherd the children of Israel for the next 40 of years, 40 years through the wilderness. Moses grabs the snake and it turns back into a staff. He's got a new identity. He's got a new calling. He's got a new role. And then God says, this is going to do this that they may believe the Lord the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Don't miss just this moment. Don't think this is just a magic show where Moses is supposed to be impressing the people. Moses has just been gifted a new role and a new identity and a new job with what he already had. Moses, I sent you out into the desert to practice leading sheep for 40 years so that you can know how to lead my children. Isn't that crazy? And by the way, if you keep reading in the book of Exodus, that's some of the things that God did with Moses' staff. It's, it's kind of crazy. Moses holds the staff over the Nile River, and it turns into blood. Moses holds it over the land of Egypt and calls forth fire, hail, and thunder. He summons a plague of locusts with that staff, and it's that staff that he holds over the Red Sea and divides it whenever they're escaping Pharaoh's pursuing armies, and they march through it as on dry ground. It's that staff that when they have no water, Moses strikes the rock with because God told him to, and water comes out of the wilderness right and it is that staff that Moses holds up over the children of Israel in their first major battle as they defeat the Amalekites 
what's in your hand? What's in your life that seems ordinary? That you think God could never use? That God wants to do great and mighty things through. See, brothers and sisters, we are called as followers of Jesus to use what is in our hand, in our lives, for God's glory and his gospel kingdom. This is not an Old Testament principle. It's a New Testament principle, right? We're to use what's in our hand for God's glory and his gospel kingdom. Peter says, as each of us has received a gift, we are to use it to serve one another as, as servants, right? Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So whatever your talents, your financial resources, your energy, whatever you've got, it's not yours to decide what to do with. It belongs to your master and it is his for you to use for his kingdom and his glory. Mary did what she could. See, she, she couldn't alter the course of history. She couldn't stop the Roman Empire from killing Jesus. She couldn't stop the Jewish authorities from falsely trying him. She couldn't stop the other disciples from running away from her beloved Savior. She couldn't bring the dead back to life as Jesus had brought her brother back to life. Mary couldn't do a lot of things. What she could do, she did. And there are far too many believers waiting around for some alternate assignment that isn't what they can actually do because they're unwilling to take that which God has actually given them and use it for his kingdom and for his glory. So do what you can with what you have that we might be found faithful. That's what we're required to be found as. It is required of stewards that they be found faithful. So, we come to God with what we have, and we come open-handed. Open-handed. What do I mean by this? Go back to Mark chapter 14, verse 3. I've already made this point. Mary's got this alabaster flask of perfume. Now, uh, this nard, this pure nard, is a tiny, tiny drop of nard is more than sufficient to perfume a human being for, for quite some time. It's really concentrated perfume. Mary takes a pound of it, according to the gospel writers. And she pours it out over Jesus' head and feet. She breaks the flask. There's no turning back. She doesn't hold back, give Jesus, Jesus, you know, <laughs> you should have showered. Here's a little drop of this. <laughs> you know, the rest of us in the room are kind of wishing you had put on deodorant. No. She breaks the flask and pours it out completely. And then when she has nothing else, she does something no Jewish woman would ever do. She takes down her hair. See, Jewish women saw their hair as their glory. Only their husband could see them uncovered. She pulls back her hair covering revealing her glory to her master, loosens her hair, takes it down, 
And instead of inviting him to look upon her glory, she puts her glory at the feet of her man. This woman is not holding back anything. It's literally all at the feet of Jesus. This gift was costly. According to the gospel writers, more than 300 denarii. A denarii was one worker's wage. 300 denarii would be more than a year's worth of wages. This is tens of thousands of dollars poured out in a moment. And brothers and sisters, we need to stop holding back and thinking, God would surely not ask me for something that is that costly. In fact, Scripture would say we should not bring anything to God that does not cost us something. King David understood this principle whenever he had sinned against his living God and, and, and God had brought a plague upon his people and then God in his mercy stopped the plague. David went to the place where the angel stood over the children of Israel where God had frozen his arm and he said, here is a place of worship. And the man who owns the land says, my king, you can take it. There's a scary angel over there. And David says, no. I don't give God that which costs me nothing. I think a lot of us want to give God that which costs us nothing, nothing in reality. And so we don't deal with the fact that God is in the business of demanding something from us. Indeed, he's demanding everything. He's, he's demanding nothing less than everything that we actually have. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to reflect on this from uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 33. Maybe we can throw that up on the screen because I don't have control here for some reason right now. Do we have that? Luke 14, 33. There we go. Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Do you hear the weight and feel the weight of what Jesus is saying to us? All. How much of your life does Jesus want? All of it. How much of your bank account does he want? All of it. How much of your time does he want? All of it. How much of your, your mind and your heart does he want? All of it. He wants it all. See, God's pleasure, brothers and sisters, is in our readiness to serve him, not in our giftedness or in our resources. And scripture says this, that it, if we give to God what is available to us to give to him, God's pleasure is found in that readiness, not according to what we don't have, but according to what we do have. God is in the business of saying, I want what is in your life and I want you to come to me open-handed. Nowhere do we see this better than the fact that Jesus decided to spend some time in the last week of his life checking the tithes and offerings. So he parks himself in the temple right in front of the giving box. <laughs> So much for pastoral discretion and, oh, don't know what we gave, Pastor. <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm watching. <laughs> Who parks themselves in front of the offering box? Jesus does, and he watches. And many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow comes, and she puts in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Jesus says to his disciples, the widow put in more than all these other people did. There's a way to even read the text saying she put in more than all of these other people did combined. Because she put in everything she had and they, they gave out of their extra. God's promised blessings, our time, our talents, our treasure, our abilities are contingent on our faith-filled obedience. Scripture says this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This is true for us, not just as individuals, 
It's true for us as organizations and churches. Years ago, when I first got called to pastor a church here, I told them in the very first meeting before I even agreed to come, I said, listen, here's the deal. We keep nothing back. Ever. It's all on the line. That's the only way for churches to live. We're not in the business of trying to secure our own future. We're in the business of pouring our lives out for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We don't hold anything back. So here's the question I want to ask before we move on. Are you coming to God open-handed or are you trying to hold something back? Is there a part of your life that you've decided doesn't actually belong to Jesus functionally? I'm not talking about in theory. God, I I can't get up in the mornings because that's my time. God, I can't give you my sexuality because then I might not have all the pleasure that I want in this world. God, I can't possibly go without a meal and fast and pray for the lost and hurting of this world because, you know, Lord, I get cranky. God, I can't show up early for church and pray and serve and help other people because, you know, I'm so tired on the weekends. You're beginning to get what I'm hinting at here? Some of us maybe are hearing God say, I've got big, bold, crazy things for you to do, and I want you to come open-handed. I want you to say, God, you can redirect my career. You can redirect my family. You can redirect me into my neighborhood. You can redirect me in leadership in church. You can redirect our church as an organization. It's all yours anyway. Come open-handed. The third thing we see is that this open-handedness always has a vertical dimension to it. Mary comes... She comes with what she has. She comes open-handed, pouring out all that she has, and she does so as an act of worship unto Jesus. And we see this in John's account of this same thing. She takes the pound of expensive ointment. She anoints the feet of Jesus. She wipes his feet with her hair. You know, if you're laying your glory at somebody else's feet, you know what you call that? Worship. worship. Picture this. Somebody wins an Olympic medal and they are up there on the stand and they walk off the stand and they take that medal and they put it on the neck of their father or their mother. What is that person saying, that athlete saying? They're saying, this person is really responsible for what I have done and achieved, right? In that same way, Mary is saying, whatever beauty I have, whatever value I have in this world, it really all belongs to Jesus. It's an act of worship. It's a response of praise to him. So why? Why was Mary alone in worshiping Jesus like this? It's not like it's a secret. Jesus has told his disciples over and over again, this is the last week of my life. Thomas has already even said to the rest of the disciples, let us go up to Jerusalem that we might die with him. They all know a climax is coming. Jesus is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he keeps putting himself out there. So was Mary doing this because there was an overflow of praise in her heart for only perhaps just a week or two or a few weeks before her brother Lazarus had been dead in the grave? And now he's sitting at the table with Jesus. Is this her worship response to what God has done in her past? Or is it a worship response to what God has done for her past? There is a different account in the Gospels of a woman in Luke 7, 37, in a different time in Jesus' ministry that did something very similar to Jesus, who washed his feet with her tears and wiped his 
feet with her hair. Was Mary responding to what Jesus had done for her sin? She sitting at the feet of Jesus, had she come to understand that he was the Savior of the world, that he would take away her sins? Was it because out of all the disciples that she maybe had been listening so carefully and clearly to what he was saying and understood that she was actually preparing his body for a funeral? That she knew the threats were so heightened that it could be at any moment that he would be taken from her? Well, the truth is we don't know all the reasons why. We do know it was worship. We know it was worship. Brothers and sisters, when we come worshiping Jesus, people are going to look at our lives and it's not going to make sense to them. Our lives will look wasteful, impractical. Five brilliant, healthy young men don't go off into the jungles of Ecuador in the 1950s to go find some people who are living in the jungle who are savage primitives who have no agenda except to kill you in order to tell them about the gospel and then choose to not use their weapons and let that tribe kill them. That's a waste, the world says. And every one of the Warani Indians that has come to believe in Jesus Christ since then knows that those five men poured their lives out at the feet of Jesus. The world will see your life as wasteful or impractical when you do this. That's what the disciples thought about Mary. Come on! This is 300 denarii. We could have given it to the poor. We, in fact, know that Judas was jealous about this because he wanted to use the money. He was a thief. Lots of people will have opinions about your life when you come open-handed and give it all to Jesus. I've been asked, why would you waste your life and your gifts in ministry in a tiny church in Central California? Others of you will see Jesus work in and through you And yet other people will look at you and say, what a waste. What a waste. But authentic worship is never wasteful. It's done to and for God. Jesus responds so strongly here. His language is emphatic. He says, leave her alone. Search your Gospels. How many times do you find Jesus using this kind of language? Leave that person alone. Why do you trouble her? You always have the poor with you. Whenever you want, you can do good for them. He's exposing their false motives. Really what they want to do is they were wanting some of that wealth and power and influence for themselves. It's embarrassing and awkward. Why are you being so embarrassing and awkward right now, Mary? That's weird. They're not seeing it for what it is. They don't understand that Jesus is going to lead them. But Mary somehow always understood that worship proceeds and participates in mission. After all, it's Mary that we find in the Gospel of Luke, her sister Martha busy cooking and doing all of the practical stuff, right? Her sister Martha frustrated because what's Mary doing? Sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening. Mary, that's a man's place. That's where the, 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 those students are. Our job as women is to fix dinner. Mary's in there studying. <laughs> She's trying to understand this. Martha, in fact, is distracted by her serving. Could some of us be distracted by our serving? Martha, Martha, Jesus says, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken from her. When we come to Jesus with what we have and we come open-handed, we come worshipful. We come with the intent to show the world how much our Savior is worth. 
Our lives are to be a worship response to Jesus. This is what Paul's trying to get to when he writes to the Romans and he says, listen, I appeal to you, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, take your life and present your life to God as a living sacrifice Set apart, that's holy, acceptable to God. Make your life a worship service. All about Jesus. And you know what you find? Jesus thinks it's beautiful. Now, if you want to search your scriptures high and low for Jesus to use the word beautiful, You'll find it here in Mark 14, 6. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Oh, what things the world will look at and say, that's a waste, it's so impractical. Don't spend your time, your life, your energy, your focus, your gifts, your talents on those kingdom things. And Jesus is looking at it and saying, that's so beautiful. So can I ask you whose opinion matters? Can I just point out to you that even if in the process of surrendering your life to Jesus, things look ugly and hard, that he makes everything beautiful in its time. When you give your life to him. Fourth principle we learn here is that we are not just to come with what we have. We're not just to come open-handed. We're not just to come worshipful and going vertical to our God, our lives are to have a horizontal element. We are to come tell a story to the world about our Savior. Come tell a story to the world about our Savior. Mark 14, 9, Jesus says this, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Jesus marks it down, and then orders three of the gospel writers to include this account in their gospels. That's how important this lesson is. Jesus says, this is part of the good news story of me. This forgotten moment. Listen, the perfume is not going to be helping him after the soldiers have spat on him, mocked him, brutalized him, tortured him, stripped him naked, lashed him till the blood has run all down his body. Once they've jammed that crown of thorns on his head, nobody's going to be thinking about it. And those feet that got wiped by her hair are going to be broken and crushed by spikes driven into his feet to hold him into a suffocating position on a cross. It is not about the practical reality. It's a good news story. Here's what I mean. I mean that Mary's gift in small ways displayed the infinite value of Jesus. Would you, knowing what was going to happen to the body of Jesus, Choose to pour out your life savings to perfume him for just a moment? You might, if Jesus was the most valuable thing you've ever seen or heard or met or encountered or could have. When we pour out our lives, giving it all to Jesus, we tell the world that there is something more important than earthly success and significance and possessions and sexual satisfaction and power and all of the things the world thinks are so important to have. We get to tell the world there is something more important 
than all of that. It's worth treasuring more. That's why Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and he bought it. The kingdom of heaven is about this abandon. Now we're going to talk about this more next week. This craziness of saying, here, take it all so that the world can see that there is one person who has lived a perfect life and it is worth everything to be in an eternal relationship with him because he is the son of the living God, Jesus. It's a trade worth making. Here's another angle on this. We can think of this, that Mary's gift was a picture or a reflection of the one who gave everything for us. Mary's small version of this becomes like a parable of the life of Jesus. Jesus will not be broken in some small way like an alabaster jar. No, Jesus' body will be broken for you and for me, for all who will accept his gift. It won't be of some perfume that's poured out. It is his blood that is poured out. That is poured out to wash us clean of our sins. In a little bit, we're going to partake of the Lord's table. That's what this table is about. So Mary's telling a gospel story by the way she's pouring out her life. You know, this is what we see in Jesus, right? He doesn't grasp at the power of God. He empties himself. He takes the form of a servant. He pours out his life for his people. He takes that form, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbles himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The good news story of Jesus is shown in some small fashion in Mary's gift to him. She tells the world there's a Savior. Yes, yes, I, I poured out all that I had for him, but don't you understand, he poured out all that he was for me. Our lives can tell a story to the world, the story of a beautiful Savior. We can smell like Jesus. We can smell like Jesus to a watching world. John says something interesting. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Nobody could go into the bedroom, the kitchen, anywhere in the house without smelling Jesus after Mary was done with him. Everybody's going to know what happened there. And then scripture says this about us. That we, we are the aroma of, of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Our lives are the perfume of Jesus, is what that's saying. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To another, a fragrance from life to life. Not all will take this perfume and think it is a beautiful scent. It will smell like death to those who are rejecting him and who know that they are headed for nothing but death. But to those who are being saved, it is the scent of life itself. None of us are sufficient for these things, for this is the work of God in and among us to take broken, sinful people, to grant them grace they don't deserve as they place their faith in him and to watch him change their lives into living testaments of his grace. So once again, I want to walk you through four questions before we pray. What do you have in your hand? Right now, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, is there some part of your life that you are holding back from the living God? And he says, I want that too. The second question is, are you coming to him trying to hold back pieces of your life? Trying to hold on to something for your own security, significance, or satisfaction? Or do you really mean it when you say, I surrender all. The third question is, are you doing the ministry and work of service and loving and giving and everything else in some way that reflects to your glory? Or are you trying intentionally to lead people to worship your God? And the fourth question is this, does the world know 
that your life is so different that they only have one possible explanation. You smell like Jesus. Let's ask the Spirit to speak to us about this. Father, take now your Holy Spirit, send him forth into our lives, convict and cleanse and change us, and make us anew and afresh. Can we confess there are maybe areas of our life that we've been holding back and saying, not there, not mine, not that. Or maybe there are things you're awakening us to that, that we've never really understood, but, but we realize now you want to take that ordinary thing in our lives and you want us to cast it down and then take it up again in such a way that it's useful for the kingdom and you're going to do amazing things. Whether, whether that's true for us as individuals or as a church, Lord, help us to see and know what this looks like. And may we do this, Father, in a way that's not about people looking at us, but rather emptying ourselves of our own glory. We cast it at your feet. We want you to be worshipped as the one who's infinitely treasurable. We want your Son to be delighted in. We're so grateful for his grace and mercy and goodness to us, and we want the world to hear a story of Jesus in our lives. And we are none of us sufficient for this. So by your grace, we ask that you would do a work this week, today, that the world may see, know, smell, delight in you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Well, before we do that, actually, go ahead and take a seat. We, one of the ways we get to celebrate the reality of the kingdom is by partaking of what Jesus gave us on the night he was betrayed. Today, we know that as the Lord's Supper. The elements, simple bread and grape juice, remind us that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed, which was the price that he paid for us. And when we partake of these elements together, we're reminded that we've been invited into a wedding feast in the kingdom of heaven, which is something that is more beautiful than we could ever imagine. <coughs> we do this as a community of faith. So if you are not sure where you stand in your relationship to Jesus and his kingdom, then we ask that you would not partake of this. Or if you have a broken relationship with someone, maybe you need to not partake of this either or until you have repented of that or made that relationship right, or at the very least, commit to do that. Scripture says, whoever eats this bread or drinks the Lord's cup in a way, in a, in a way unworthy of the Lord will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and set him, <coughs> so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he himself, <coughs> For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy way eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not discern the Lord's body. So this is important for us to understand because when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're recognizing that the body and blood of Jesus Christ was given for his church and for the establishment of his kingdom. So if we, rep if we repent and believe in what he has done for us, then the kingdom is for us. And we get to live in that today. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray and bless these elements. We're going to have a time of singing together as the elements are handed out to you, and then we're going to partake of them together. So let's use this time to reflect and think on what Christ has done for us. I invite you to join me in prayer. Most merciful Father, it is with thankful hearts that we celebrate our redemption in this memorial of the Last Supper. As we recall Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you every part of this remembrance as a gift of praise and thanksgiving. We ask that you would use these elements to remind us of the grace that is greater than all of our sin and our weakness. Also to remind us that we have been bought by the price that your son paid for us and how he has invited us into a community that we don't deserve to be in because of anything that we've done. We are instead invited in by what he has done for us. All of this 
we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing. could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. During the supper, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and passed it amongst his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and passed it amongst his disciples, saying, This cup is my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. It is the new covenant, the new relationship in my blood. Drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I invite you to stand as we sing. <coughs> You 
stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? to service. Please pray with me now as I read this passage from Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. So a reminder, there are no small groups meeting tonight. Um, small groups will, reserve nec will resume next Sunday, 
327. Um, and then on April 3rd, we have Tech Sabbath Sunday. So our service has ended. Feel free to take about five to 10 minutes to fellowship with one another before we begin takedown.